Uh, welcome to our Bible study tonight. Chapel of the Cross is uh, recording this Enduring Faith Bible study from Unit 3, Week 8, and Ascending Truth, comparing the texts from the end of Luke's Gospel and the beginning of his uh, book called The Acts. So um, by way of process, we're going to go through this in four sections, contrasting and comparing the two accounts, each having a specific question or two. But always, if other thoughts emerge, please feel free to share them by by speaking. Um, moving ahead, if you did not print out the lesson, that's probably okay. Um, it's essentially all on the screen. So our Bible truth tonight is simply Jesus ascends into heaven. And the goal is that when we're done and someone says, so how is Bible class? We can explain Jesus' ascension really matters. It matters for me and it matters for the life of the church. The key verse is really from a parallel, Matthew 28, where Jesus says, I'm always with you. And in good Lutheran fashion, when we go through scripture, sometimes we're moved to confess when we hear the law. And our confession tonight might be simple, simple as uh, we confess that so often we live as though Jesus really isn't active in our world or maybe even in our lives. But the gospel of the good news is that Jesus boldly ascended into heaven to prepare a place for us, promising to always be with us. Looks like we might have someone else trying to join, and I'll admit them if they wish to be part of this. Okay. Um, so as far as a scriptural snapshot, during his last days on earth, Jesus instructs his disciples, preparing them for the challenges that lie ahead. Gathering his disciples on the Mount of Olives one last time, Jesus physically ascends to heaven, and two angels appear, and they repeat Christ's promise that he will return in the same way that he went to heaven. So we want to remember Jesus is always with us as the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We are children of God. So uh, we're called then to share that good news by our, our neighbors, those near and far that he is the savior of the world. So are there any prayer requests before we get started with the prayer? Uh, seeing none, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the, in the greatness of your love and lift up our hearts to you in prayer and praise. Uh, we thank you that the way to your presence is always open through your son, our Lord. And that you invite us to draw near in full assurance of faith. Help us to pray simply and sincerely, unselfishly, gratefully, remembering the needs of others as well as our own. And to give thanks always for everything. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right, we always like to start with an opening reflection. So here it is. Think of a time when someone you know had to move far away for a time to do some important work. What kind of an impact, what sort of impact did their moving away, did that move have on, on you, on the people in their lives? Anyone have someone move away to do some good work? Well, certainly uh, around here at chapel, many of us recall when uh, Eric and Linda Funky were going to go to Tanzania. And uh, while my children have never gone that far away for that long, uh, this can be a pretty emotional topic for some people. When a loved one or important person in our lives moves away, it can be very tough. Having said that, at the same time, this question helps bring home the overall mood of Jesus' ascension. He ascended to the Father's side for a time to do very important work, preparing a place for us, but also working among us through the Spirit whom he sends to work through his people through the means of grace. So in this way, Jesus is not only near us, around us, but his work continues among us and through us. He's multiplied as he uses his very people to extend his reign of grace throughout this very lost and broken world. This next slide just has a couple simple things on us to get us going. First of all, Luke, the writer of the gospel, begins the book of Acts to the, of the apostles 
leading into the ascension. X is dated to about 62 to 64 AD. That's about two years after he wrote the Gospel of Luke. And these, this is about 30 years after Jesus' resurrection. On the screen, you see it says Luke uh, addresses the book of Acts to O Theophilus, where in the Gospel of Luke, you might recall that he addresses it at the beginning to most excellent Theophilus. So I just mentioned this because it's a powerful way to know just how historically accurate the Bible is. The Gospel of Luke uses most excellent Theophilus as an indication that he was a high official in the office of the high priest, in fact. Josephus, the historian, mentions Theophilus, governed in the first century and held office of the high priest from 36 to 41. During the time when the Hellenistic Messianic Jews were very persecuted by the Jewish government and uh, the Jewish people. So Luke's gospel, he addresses Theophilus as most excellent, probably means he was holding the office of the high priest. Now, in Acts, which is written later, when Paul was in prison at Rome, long after Theophilus had held office, is likely why he says, oh, Theophilus, probably three to five years after he left that post. I just think it's very interesting to note how actually accurate scripture is for us. And when we probe into little things like that, something can come up. One other thing about this image of the scroll. Ancient books generally, as we know, were written on papyrus scrolls, and it was practical and practice actually to have a scroll up to 35 feet in length. If it got any longer, it was just too bulky to carry around. So this physical limitation determined many of the books in the Bible, how long they were. One commentator, James Montgomery uh, Boyce said, Luke set out to write a history of Jesus' life and expanded the church up to the time of his own age, and he did so on two scrolls. All right, our first text here is printed. Uh, would someone like to, to volunteer to read this? I'll read it. Thank you. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Thank you, Anne. So he states that for 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, he uh, appeared to his disciples, presenting and proving his resurrection in body but also speaking of his ongoing work in the kingdom that began in Luke and now will continue. And continuing, if you'd like to go another little page, Ann, that'd be great. Yeah, I can. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father which he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Good, so that little, um, see if I can mark here, this little um, asterisk right here tells us that there's something about that word staying. And that word actually uh, means that when Jesus was with them, he was, basically reclining at table in fellowship and in an eating posture. So, and while staying, while he was with them, he wasn't just standing around. He was intimately having a conversation with them. He ordered them not to depart. John baptized with water, though a necessary and spirit-filled gift for repentance and forgiveness. It'll be followed by a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that will empower the disciples to extend the borders of the kingdom in a very special way, as, as we'll soon see. So why do you suppose in, in, there's a connection? What, what would that connection be between Jesus' teaching of the kingdom and baptism and the coming of the Spirit?
Well, after Jesus' resurrection, he certainly planned on ascending to his throne at the right hand of the Father. From there, he could be with his people through the Spirit, whom he would pour out on his disciples at Pentecost to empower them. Raise your hand. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's something I was thinking about why he had to ascend. And because he says, I've got to leave so I can send the spirit. And of Good. course, that changed uh, what they really found out what Jesus was teaching. It also changed baptism. And I would imagine it also changed what happened in 70 AD. Good point. Right. First, at baptism, we too are given the Holy Spirit, who not only creates faith, but also works through us to witness, to proclaim God's word to a, to a hurting world. Correct. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And we'll see in the following slides another point you made there. See if I can advance that there. Bill? Yes. I have a question. I probably should know this. But if John baptized with water and Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit, were they all rebaptized <laughs> the disciples? Um, that's an interesting question. It would, he did not rebaptize them with water. Okay, what I understand just... is he gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so, so we, uh, Jim, you were pointing out our, for us, the Holy Spirit comes through baptism with water. Right. I would think that he gave them the baptism of the Spirit at, at Pentecost. Yes, and we'll talk more about that next week. That's a great point, Kathy. I'm glad you brought that up. I just kind of hit me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, oh, sure. Excellent. So here's the next question, and then we're going to read Acts 6 to 11. I put the question up front so we can think about it a little bit. And the reflection question asks, what words or phrases from this section help you understand how the borders of Christ's kingdom on earth will extend after he ascends? Okay, and then we'll go ahead and, and read that couple slides here. Uh, would someone like to read that for us? Or I can, that's, that's great. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's interesting to note a couple of things in this, this slide. Uh, first, about the geography of where the witnessing will take place. Four places are referenced here in verse 8. Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. But if you look carefully at that text, um, there's a definite article before Judea, suggesting that Judea and Samaria belong together, making this a three-part outline, which is exactly what the book of Acts follows. Acts chapters 1 through 7 are the work in Jerusalem. Chapters 8 through 12, the gospel expands to Judea and Samaria. And the last chapters, 13 to 28, record the expansion of the gospel throughout the Roman world. So we, if we think of it in three sections, we get the outline of, of the, the book of Acts. And when they had said these things, as they were looking on him, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight and while they were gazing into heaven <laughs> behold two men stood by them in white robes and said men of galilee why do you stand looking into heaven this jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven now, some notes here. Uh, the disciples, understandably, are still somewhat confused as they wonder, is this going to be the time for Jesus to establish his kingdom of glory here on earth? Instead, Jesus shows them how he will extend the kingdom of grace. Here's the how part. Ascend to the Father's throne, 
the crowd gathered there on the olives, uh, Olivet Mountain, looking up into the sky. They're visited by two angels who explain the significance of what just happened, that Jesus who left in this way will return in the same way. Then the kingdom of glory would begin and the sending of the spirit to them who will work through these disciples to witness and spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. So what words or phrases in this section help us understand how the borders would extend? Well, Jesus tells them to wait in Jerusalem until they're empowered by the Spirit. And then under that power, the disciples will be Jesus' witnesses locally and beyond. Jesus who ascends, sends the Spirit to his people will use his people as his agents to carry his word into the entire world. So as we read in verse 6 and before, the disciples were not thinking about the heavenly kingdom. You can tell by what they asked. Their minds were on the earthly kingdom. It's clear that they did not yet fully understand. They were looking for three other kingdoms than the, than the heavenly kingdom. They were looking for a political kingdom. We know this because they use the word restore like to the time of the reign of King David, Israel's glory days, are you going to restore the kingdom? They were also looking for an eth ethnically restricted kingdom. We know this from how they phrased their question, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It just shows that their minds were not yet on the Gentile involvement. Their culture, you know, despised the Gentiles implying that they can be welcome if they become like us. And we know later in scripture, there were some Judaizers who, who wanted circumcision of the Gentiles. But finally, we know they were looking for a kingdom that would be centered in Jerusalem. That's where David and Solomon reigned. So what about the Greeks and the Romans? Sure, they can come to Jerusalem and become like us and, and join us here. But Jesus tell them, you know, tells them it's not for you to know. Your task is to obey and then to go in my power to form a spiritual kingdom, a powerful kingdom, a kingdom of truth that will be worldwide. And this task of witnessing to this gospel has been passed on to us. You know, the word uh, witness comes from the old English wit literally to know. So a witness is someone who knows something and testifies to it. And the Holy Spirit empowers this sharing. So you can think back to Luke 17, 21, where he told his disciples, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Not in Jerusalem, not political, and not exclusive of all nations. Our next section is going to have this little question here. Yeah, yeah comments or questions? Yes, uh, this is Jim again. Hi, Jim. Uh, were they still trying to live under the law at to this point? That's a really good question. I think there was a strong understanding that um, that's exactly how they were to live, especially uh, keeping the Sabbath but more so keeping the first commandment that there would be no other gods before me. And for Jesus to claim that he was one with the Father and the Spirit really was challenging their monotheistic thinking. So, Well, just with uh, wanting circumcision, which was a law. Absolutely. That would tend to make me think they were still trying to live by the law, and that's what they expected. Yes, I would say that's a good insight. Okay. Uh, so example. now we're going to compare a little bit of this to Luke 24 and ask the question, how is this account of the ascension similar to what we just read in Acts 1? And what additional richness does uh, this text from Luke add to the picture of the event that we have from Acts? So now we're going to go ahead and read that. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. 
Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead. So all scripture pointed to his identity, his work, and his word. And this idea, again, that Christ should suffer, actually better stated, must suffer. He had to endure the suffering in order to fulfill our salvation and grant us forgiveness. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And we'll talk a bit more about that. Okay, how is this account in Luke similar to Acts? And do we get a bit richer uh, picture in our minds? Well, yeah, we sure do. It's a parallel account of the same events after Jesus shows his disciples the true reality of his resurrection. He gives them his final teaching before ascending. Uh, he teaches them the things in the Old Testament concerning himself that underneath the history, the poetry, the prophets, the, all of it, everything pointed to him, to Jesus as the one to fulfill God's plan of salvation promised to Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Jesus opens their minds to understand the scriptures and the events of the passion and resurrection and tells them to wait in Jerusalem for the next chapter in God's plan. The coming of the Spirit would empower their witness to go out into the world. So, in Acts, Jesus elaborates on how his mission would, would, would be fulfilled. He teaches the witnessing uh, that they will do is his sending of them, that it will be of repentance and forgiveness, and elaborates uh, that the gift of the Spirit will be the delivered promise of the Father. Now, Luke adds more rich detail in, in Acts about the nature of what will happen at Pentecost and afterward. You'll receive power from on high. Literally, that means clothed or covered with the power to do mighty things. In the Old Testament, only a few people were empowered. Select people, you remember them, Moses, Samson, a judge here, a king there. The idea is that the Spirit of the Lord was given to equip them for works to point to God's power and his love and his plan for salvation. Think back, you might remember uh, the little section in Numbers 11 where Moses says to Joshua, who's helping him, they're talking about Eldad and Medad. These guys who came into the camp, it says the spirit of the Lord rested upon them and they began to prophesy in the camp. Then the young men came up and, and told them this. And Joshua said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses said, are you jealous on my account for my sake? I wish all God's people were prophets. And that the Lord would make his spirit to come upon all of them. Now, the prophet Joel, you might remember Joel chapter 2, picks up on this idea and makes Moses' idea into a prophecy, his wish into an actual prophecy. Joel says, the days are coming when I will put my spirit on all of my people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. Even on my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So the prayer of Moses becomes the prophecy of Joel, and that is how Peter will speak on the day of Pentecost, quoting Joel. So Jesus here is saying, this is about to happen, guys, but you have to wait. You have got to wait. So that's what they were going to do. Uh, go there to Jerusalem and then wait. So how does the emphasis in Luke help build our understanding of Acts? It, it, adds, it adds depth and richness, some details. And what can we learn from the disciples about how we should understand the ascension? That's what we're going to grab onto next. Luke 24, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, where they continually 
uh, were in the temple of God blessing him. So after the crucifixion, death, the apostles were, they were ready to pack it in. They were hiding, they were fearful. They believed Jesus was the Messiah, but they also doubted. Was everything going to go back to the way it was three and a half years ago? Jesus leads his followers to Bethany in the Mount of Olives and gives a blessing, and he blesses them. He's As he's blessing them, he's carried up to heaven. He's parted from them and ascends in, in clouds of glory. And so the disciples worshipped him, and they waited. Um, they continually met in the temple, waiting for the fulfillment of Jesus' promise, praising God constantly in the temple. So uh, the mood in Acts was a bit bewilderment. The mood in Luke was joyful and worshipful. Jesus' disciples had a lot of mixed emotions following his ascension, to be sure, but ultimately they were filled with joy. We, too, can find great comfort in knowing that our king is not only sitting on his throne in heaven, but he's reigning among his people by his grace, by the Spirit, through his means. So Jesus, who died and rose again, though not sitting on a throne here on earth, is not far from us. He's still reigning from the Father's side. So explain why Jesus' ascension matters to you, to me, to the life of our church. Any thoughts? Yeah, Bill, uh, for me, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's really too bad that the church has short uh, shortchanged the ascension. Um, to me, it's the uh, completion of the mission. And to me, it's kind of the trifecta where, you know, Good Friday, our sins are forgiven. Easter gives us eternal life. Does, doesn't say anything about where. It's the ascension that gives us the where. And so to me, it's, it's the third part of the package. Thank you for that. Yes. Anyone else thoughts on why it's so important for us in the life of the church? Uh, I have a thought. Yes. Well, what did he do when he ascended? He went up and he was building a mansion, but he also judged us righteous to go to heaven. And it's so it's the righteousness that we received when he went on his throne. Without that righteousness, where would we be? Oh boy, absolutely. I put a few points down here. Uh, Jesus' ascension really does matter. Uh, Jesus suffered to fulfill all scripture. Salvation has been earned by that. Jesus is risen. He is in heaven preparing a place for us. He is at the Father's right hand petitioning on our behalf. He is coming again. He was glorified and we too shall be glorified. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit. If the work of God is to be filled, the power of God is necessary to fulfill it. It's not simply not enough to know what we need to do. We need the power of God to equip our words to have any effect. So the apostles prayed for the power of God to come in Acts 1.14. And God moved upon them to do the work which confirmed his word and their words as they served him. So their prayers showed their faith. You know, the Great Commission is, is a command by God, but it is more than that. It's an invitation by God to go into his world under his power, for without that power, without the Holy Spirit, in, with, and under the means of grace, the word and sacraments, we would have no hope to accomplish his mission at all. So Jesus' ascension really does matter, and I wanted to just share this section from Philippians. So the world rejected him and it will reject his rule now. 
and his followers. But it's so encouraging to remember what Paul wrote in Philippians, that we must remember our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So as hard it was, <laughs> it is to say goodbye to people we love when they go to do important work. The apostles would soon not have Jesus with them, but in another way, he would be with them. And as scripture says, the Holy Spirit would be in them, not next to them, not on the other side of the table, but in them. Ascension really does matter, and it's a great source of great joy for us all. Uh, we've got just another moment, so before the prayer, I just wanted to share another little thing from Ephesians. And the screen might be small, so I'm going to try and uh, read it. And what in Ephesians 1 and 2, we've got a very interesting combination here. It's a Dave, you used the word trifecta. This is another nice inclusio, so to speak. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his father, of his, of his power, the father's power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might, that he, who, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. And then below in Ephesians 2, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trans, you know, our sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. What a powerful thing making the ascension so, so critical for us. Paul picks up on this repeatedly, and in these words especially, showing that, yes, there's going to be salvation. And what are we going to be doing in heaven? We're going to be praising God for sure. And in the position of uh, respect, in the position of children of the Heavenly Father, right with Jesus at his right hand, uh, we'll be seated with him. So the Ascension is a beautiful thing with, that we often celebrate in our church and sometimes in a circuit or larger groups where many churches get together. And um, we even talked about that at our staff meeting today. Is there a possibility we might consider? Is it feasible that we might have these virtual worship services with many churches? That might be a, uh, something to think about. Any other final thoughts or, or comments on our study today? Bill? Yes, thank you. I think it's interesting that uh, the ascension uh, in the four Gospels is only mentioned by Luke. And Luke, I also think, uh, wrote this part of Acts. Yes. And he seemed like he was a little further ahead in understanding than the other our apostles. He, he just... Right. Uh, he need to have a little better idea what was. He did in some ways. Uh, you know, Matthew was written for the Jewish world, and and uh, Luke, being in his position, wanted to tie the Old Testament to the New Testament to make it clear. So it's very unique in that. You're right. We're grateful for that. All right. Well, I have a prayer uh, today. Um, yeah. Oh, yes. I have one comment, and then Lois has a comment. Uh, one of the things I noticed in, the, uh, in Luke uh, refers back to our study of Emmaus last week. And I saw the one section that says, and he opened their minds. And that was the very same thing that he did with the Emmaus disciples. At a particular point, he opened their minds so that they could believe. Yes. Very important. Uh, without him doing that, how could they have acted on his command? They saw 
they saw him transfigured in a glorious way and knew when he came back that we too would be transfigured in a glorious way. Yeah, he opens our eyes through his word, through his sacrament. And we are so grateful for that. that we can't not tell people about it. We're witnesses. He's forgiven us. He's given us the promise of heaven. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for your comments and your insights. Lois has one comment. Lois, I mean, Bill, in the prayer tonight, can you include the Schmitz? Absolutely. They need lots of prayer. And, and Jacob and Megan. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather in this uh, way tonight to give you thanks for your word, for your spirit. Uh, you blessed your son, our savior, uh, Jesus Christ, who ascended far above us all the way to heaven, that he might uh, send his spirit and prepare a place for us, that he might fill all things. We ask that you would be merciful to grant us such a faith to trust that he abides with us here on this earth and he equips us to do your work. Keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. And tonight we pray for those whose eyes may be tempted to, to look at the earthly things a little more heavily than we might. Uh, certainly the Purcells, Lord. Uh, when you lose earthly possessions, um, that can be a great sense of uh, emotional loss, but having our faith anchored in you, Lord. Give them a great peace to know that what really matters cannot be taken away. Nothing can snatch us from your hands. And thank you, Lord, that, that the church responds in love and the high school responds in, in ways that are tangible. And where we can be of use, Lord, let them be comfortable you know, to make their requests known. And where we can respond, Lord, uh, move us to do that, that you might receive the glory for you live in us and you have um, your, your children draw near to one another in times of need. So be with us, Lord, and help us to be with one another the best that we can in these days where social distancing is um, pretty much required. Stay close to us, Lord, this night as we go our separate ways and bless us, thanking you for the ascension and the promise of your spirit and your return. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. I have a real quick question about Jacob and Megan. Um, my daughter had gathered up some things and friends of hers to take over to the apartment complex because they were taking things, but now they're not. Is there a place to go? Do you know with these items? That's a great question. I haven't heard anything announced. Um, that would be a good question for them. Uh, I don't know if the Schmitz want to fill their their garage with things other than what they have room for. Maybe the church, maybe our facility. Well, it was kind of like for everybody too, not just them. And I just wondered oh. if anybody knew about, I mean, to give them things too, but I'm just saying if anybody knew where people could be giving to all these people that lost their, it's not just them that lost everything. But Thank there, you. Awesome. There's people out there looking for places to take the stuff. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. We'll have to follow up on that. Um, I'll ask Pastor if he knows of something that's been put together. Okay. And uh, if I find out something like that, I'll email everybody on our on our list tonight. Okay. Okay. We were going to ask Dave Funky what we're doing for uh, our people that are in a hospital from Chapel. Yes. Is Dave still on? Uh, he is. He's on mute. Yeah. Uh, when families can't even get in to see people like Sandy went, can't get in to see Earl, we too are limited. And uh, so we rely on the chaplains that are already at the hospital uh, to check in on them. And then they also call pastor to kind of give him an update of our members. 
uh, wherever they're at. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. Because I figured it, you could not probably go and visit them. That's correct. So, well, thank you, Dave. Sure. All right, hey, thanks, everybody. Watches, we'll Dave, see you next Wednesday. In the hospital. Bill, sorry. We didn't hear it. Who? Who was it that was in the hospital that we couldn't go see? Earl went, and oh, okay. uh, and uh, Fran Bermel is also in. Okay. Does Earl have COVID nineteen or what's what's his? Uh, he had a, a massive heart attack. Oh, really? Over the weekend, they did surgery. Um, having a kind of a difficult time apparently coming out of it, uh, out of it and uh, getting stabilized. They had to go back in uh, and uh, redo the stent or expand it some more or something like that. So they're not sure how much longer he will be in. Oh, okay. Certainly keep Fran and Earl and, and their families in our prayers too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Yeah. All right, have a blessed evening, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.